Hello and welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be showing you how to build a PC for under a thousand pounds. And this is going to be another full step-by-step -step PC build guide where I'm going to show you how to put all the parts I've got in front of me together today and come up with a fully working PC by the end of the video. So as well as showing you how to put everything together, I'm going to show you how to install Windows 10. I'll show you how to install any drivers or programs you're going to need to get your PC up and running. I'll show you how to install any RGB software you're going to need and give you a demonstration of how it works. I'll show you how to enter the BIOS if our motherboard needs a BIOS update. I'll show you how to do that. I'll show you how to overclock the RAM, adjust the fan curves, and then at the end of the video, we'll run some benchmarks to give you an idea of the performance you can expect from this PC. So if you've never built a PC before, you've definitely come to the right place. So we'll make a start by looking at the parts I've chosen for today's build. For the case, I've gone with Lian Lee's Lancool 215, and this is their latest budget-orientated case. And although it's budget-orientated, I think it's a great-looking case, and it comes with a lot of features included as standard. Looking at the front of the case, the most striking feature is the two 200mm ARGB fans that come as standard. As well, at the rear of the case, we've got a standard black 120mm fan. So right out of the box, you're going to get some great looks, but also some great cooling performance. For the motherboard, I've gone with the ROG Strix B450 F Gaming 2 motherboard. Now, the two in the name is very important. This indicates that this is one of the B450 motherboards that Asus have revised recently with some upgraded features. One of the nice things about this motherboard is it will support Ryzen 3000 series CPUs right out of the box, which is great for us because we've got a 3000 series CPU for this build. Another nice feature that Asus have added to the motherboard is a BIOS flashback button, which means you can use this motherboard right out of the box with a 5000 series CPU once they provide an updated BIOS. You're going to need to flash the BIOS before you can do that, but before they added the flash BIOS button, the only way this would work was if you used an older CPU on the motherboard first, use that to update the BIOS, and then added your newer CPU. So it's going to save you a whole lot of hassle. You might be wondering why I haven't gone with a B550 motherboard for this build, and that comes down to price and performance. A B550 motherboard is probably going to cost an extra £70 to get a motherboard that looks as good as this motherboard, and it's not going to offer that level of performance. Really, the only thing that B550 offers that this motherboard doesn't is Gen 4 speeds. And the only place that makes a significant difference at the moment is with your M.2 SSD storage. And when you factor in, you're going to pay an extra £70 for the motherboard, and then you're going to have to pay significantly more money for the M.2 SSD to get a Gen 4 drive. It doesn't make sense at this price point. For the CPU, I've gone with the Ryzen 5 3600. This is a 6-core, 12-thread CPU. So I think for a PC in this price point, this is the perfect CPU. It's going to be very comfortable for gaming, and you're really only going to get very minimal benefits by spending more on your CPU if you're using your PC for gaming. The CPU is also going to let you stream and edit videos, although if you are planning to use your PC for lots of CPU-intensive tasks where your multitasking is going to be important, you may want to consider going with an 8-core CPU. But for all-round PC use, particularly for gaming, I think this is the perfect CPU at this price point. For RAM, we've got 16 gigabytes of Kingston's HyperX Fury RGB at 3600 MHz, and you should be able to pick up this kit for just under £90. So I think 16 gigabytes is going to be the sweet spot for this PC. I think adding less in, it's going to cause a bottleneck for the other components. Adding more, you're going to have to sacrifice in some of the other components, and you're not going to get a price performance benefit. Looking at the speed of the RAM, Ryzen does like faster RAM, and 3600MHz, again, I think is the sweet spot for a PC in this price point. So this kit that we've got is perfect for today's build, and a big thanks to Kingston for sending it out. For storage in the PC, I'm going with a single NVMe M.2 SSD from Crucial. It's their P5 in 500GB of size. And I managed to pick this drive up for £57. And again, I think for a PC in this price point, we should be going with an NVMe M.2 SSD rather than a SATA drive, because it's going to offer significantly more performance at only a slightly increased price. Um, obviously, storage-wise, 500 gigabytes should be plenty to get started with, and again, we can always add an extra drive into the build at a later stage. This motherboard does have two M.2 SSD slots, or add a SATA drive 
for additional storage in the future. Just a word of caution, when you're picking your drive, just remember M.2 SSD does not necessarily mean NVMe. There is SATA M.2 SSDs and they're going to offer very similar performance to a 2.5 inch SATA drive when it comes to speed. NVMe is going to be significantly faster. So obviously you don't have to use the same drive I've picked, but if you are looking for one, it's the NVMe that you want to get the same performance. For the graphics card, I've gone with NVIDIA's 3060 Ti, which I paid £369 for. And certainly these new 3000 series graphics cards offer significant performance over the previous generation. The only problem at the moment is you can't actually buy this, but that can actually be said for any graphics card at the moment. If you look at all the retailers at the time of making this video, they're sold out of almost every graphics card. So although I'm including this in today's build, hopefully when you're watching this in a few months time, you're gonna actually be able to go out and buy this. If you do get a different NVIDIA graphics card, the process for installing it and any of the drivers is going to be very similar to what I'm doing in this build, so you should still be able to follow along with this guide. If you go with an AMD card, I have made a previous build video showing how to install the drivers for that particular card. So again, looking through my previous videos, you should be okay to be able to follow along with this particular guide. For the power supply, I've gone with the Corsair CV550, which I managed to pick up for just over £45. The big reason I've gone for this power supply is firstly it comes from a well recognized brand such as Corsair and this would be one area I wouldn't try and save some money by going from a power supply from an unrecognized brand. The second reason is it comes with all black cables and this is going to significantly improve the look of our build. So when you're getting a power supply, a 550 watt power supply, which is plenty of power for this build, all black cables, well recognized brand and only £45, it's an absolute bargain. Okay, so now we come on to your options in this build. The parts I've listed so far will allow you to build a fully working PC for under £900. To do that, we're going to have to use the CPU cooler that comes in the box with our Ryzen 3600. But this isn't going to be a particularly difficult CPU to cool. And the cooler in the box will do a good enough job when it comes to performance but it might be a little bit noisy and not look as good. I'm not going to show you how to install the CPU cooler in this particular build video because I've made a separate video on installing the cooler. So again, I'll link to that in the description should you want to go down this route. What I am going to show you how to do is to install a 240mm AIO. The AIO that I've chosen for today's build is from Cooler Master. It's their Master Liquid ML240 Mirror, which I managed to pick up for just under £100. So going with an AIO for this build is going to do two things. The first is going to offer significantly better cooling potential. As a result, the AIO is not going to have to work anywhere near as hard as the stock CPU cooler to keep the CPU at the same temperature. So not having to work as hard, the fans are going to spin less and hopefully there'll be much less noise from the build. The second thing, it's going to look significantly better. The ARGB effects on the pump head for this particular AIO look incredible. So the main things we're going to get are improved performance, improved noise levels, and hopefully better aesthetics to the build. But that is going to come at a cost, and that cost is just under £100. And you may not want to go down that route, because actually you're going to get very similar performance by using the stock killer. You may want to build yourself a cheaper PC. Like I've said, you can build a PC for under £900 rather than under 1000 Or you may want to keep the budget the same and upgrade the 3060 Ti to a 3070. And again, the choice of that is up to you. So that brings the build price to just under £1,000. I want to tell you about two optional items you can add into the build. They won't improve the performance of the build at all. But I think for very little extra charge, they will significantly improve the aesthetics. I'm planning to replace the rear standard black fan in this case, which doesn't have any ARGB on it, with this particular fan. And again, you don't have to go with this particular fan. Any ARGB fan at the back will do as an optional upgrade. The second optional item is a black and white cable extension for the 24 pin power supply cable. This costs just under £12 and comes from a company called Shackmod. One of the nice things about this build is we're actually going to be able to get away with a single cable extension. 
we're not actually going to be able to see the additional power supply cable for the CPU, which plugs into the top left-hand side of the motherboard, because our radiator and fans are going to be covering it. So no reason to pick up a cable extension for there. And with our graphics card, we're going to need to use the black extension cable that comes in the box. So a black and white cable extension, we're not going to see it. It's going to be behind the case anyway. So for £12, this is going to significantly improve the look of our build. And again, I would recommend going with these two optional items. The reason I've listed them as optional is I set myself the challenge to build for under £1,000. But again, I would recommend going for these. You're going to be able to judge this for yourself. Have a look at the build at the end and see do you think they're worth it. Again, I'll show you how to build both with and without them. Okay, that's all the parts. Let's get on with the build. The first thing I like to do in any build is to repair the case. By that, I mean removing any panels or dust filters that are going to get in our way during the build. As we're going along as well, I'll point out the main case features. So let's make a start by getting the panels off. The side panels are held on with thumb screws at the back. These are captive, so once they're loosened, we can simply pull the panel back and away. We've got a magnetic dust filter on the top, which can simply be lifted off. The front panel can be removed by pulling firmly from the bottom. It's the same story with the other side panel, just loosen the thumb screws at the back, pull backwards and lift away. Our second dust filter is at the back, it can simply be pulled out from the back of the case. We're not going to need to remove this for the build, so I am going to go ahead and put it back. The reason I've removed it is just to show you how to remove it for cleaning, which you're going to need to do on a regular basis. Looking inside the case, we can see the front fan mounting slots are occupied with 200mm fans and we've got a single 120mm fan at the rear of the case. There's room to mount additional fans or radiators on the top, and we can also mount further fans here above the power supply shroud. We've got a cutout here at the front of the case to allow radiators to be mounted at the front, and one of the nice things about this case is you can actually leave the original fans in place with a radiator and then fans on the radiator in behind it. To mount the radiator, you would have to remove these front fans, but in this particular build, we're going to mount our radiator on the top of the case so we can leave the front fans as they are. In the rear of the case, we've got a fan hub stroke ARGB hub, and our fans at the front and at the rear are already plugged into this. At the bottom of the case, we've got a hard drive cage, and we've got two dedicated 2.5 inch hard drive mounts here on the back of the case. At the rear of the case, we can see a little accessory bag here. I'll open this and show you what's in it. So this is what's contained in the accessory bag. So screw A and screw B look very similar to each other. Screw A has a little flat lip around the outside of the screw, whereas screw B is fully rounded the whole way around the outside. Now, screw A you're going to use to secure your motherboard to the case, as well to mount 2.5 inch SSDs. Screw B is for mounting 3.5 inch hard drives. Screw C is for securing your power supply to the case. Part D is additional standoffs. Part E is the tool for removing and then re-securing the standoffs to the back of the case. Part F is some cable ties for cable management. Part G are screws for securing 120mm fans on top of the power supply stride. The fans are actually screwed in from above and to do that you're going to need slightly longer screws than standard fan screws. These are standard fan screws. The reason the Andy have done it this way is that if you were to try to secure them like normal fans, you would have to screw them in from underneath. And you would actually struggle with a screwdriver to get it into the power supply compartment and screw the fans in using normal screws. And then part H is standard fan screws for securing fans at the top of the case. This is our motherboard. We're going to do as much work with the motherboard as we can while it's on the table because it's much easier to work on it on a flat table than it is on the cramped confines of a case. So we're going to go ahead and install our CPU into this socket here, our M.2 SSD into this socket. We're going to put our RAM into here, all before we put the motherboard into the case. But before we do that, there's a little bit of plastic protection here and here that we need to remove. So we're going to put our CPU into this socket here in the centre of the motherboard. Before we do that, I want to point out an important feature of the socket. If we look at this corner on the top left hand side, you'll notice that it has a little triangle on the corner of the socket. And none of the other corners of the socket have that triangle. This triangle is important to help us line our CPU up in the right orientation in the socket. To prepare the socket to receive the CPU, all we need to do is open this little lever here 
all the way over to the right hand side. This is our CPU. What you'll notice is I'm holding it by the edges and the reason for that is I don't want to damage these gold pins on the underside of the CPU. If I do that I can render our CPU absolutely useless. The other thing to point out, if you look at the corner and the top of the screen, it has a little gold triangle on it. None of the other corners on the socket have this gold triangle. So this is the corner of the CPU that we're going to have to line up with the mark on the socket. Also, if I turn the CPU over, you'll notice the same corner, which is now down in the bottom left hand side, has a little gold triangle on it. Okay, so I've got our CPU lined up correctly. The little gold mark is up at the top left hand corner. And I'm just going to hover it over the socket and let it fall into place. See like it's just fallen in now? It's really important if it doesn't fall in, you just move it around gently till it falls into place. You don't want to go pushing it down because if you do that you can damage the pins. I still don't want to go pushing down now. The last step I need to do to finish installing the CPU is just close the little lever over. And we've now installed our CPU. The next thing for us to do is install our M.2 SSD. And this motherboard has two sockets. There's one that we can see here, and we've got a second one hiding behind this heat sink. Now it's really important you look at the specifications of the sockets in the motherboard manual because quite often the sockets aren't created equally. Um, when I looked at the manual, both the socket at the top and the second socket both have four PCIe lanes associated to them. Importantly though, whenever you install an M.2 in each of the sockets, there is a sacrifice to make. When we install an M.2 into the top socket, SATA ports 5 and 6 become deactivated. When we install an M.2 SSD into the bottom socket, our graphics card will have its lanes reduced from 16 to 8. So weighing things up, for us it makes sense to install our M.2 SSD into the top socket. We're not going to install any SATA drives, so we're not really worried about SATA ports 5 and 6 becoming deactivated. And if we do want to install one in the future, we've still got four active SATA ports. And it just doesn't make sense for us to use this socket because we don't want to reduce the potential performance of our graphics card. You could argue that we'll never actually see the reduction in PCIe lanes, but again, to me, it doesn't make sense to do that. The only negative with us installing our M.2 SSD in the top socket, and this is quite a strange choice I think Asus have made with this board, the heatsink is actually on the socket on the bottom. And there doesn't seem to be an option to move this heatsink to the top. So having the heatsink on the M.2 drive is actually going to help it run cooler. And given that in general you want to install your M.2 SSD in the top socket of most motherboards, I can't understand why Asus have put the heatsink on the bottom socket. This is our M.2 SSD. You'll notice there's gold connectors to the right hand side. That's what's going to plug into the motherboard. The gold semicircular connector over to the left hand side is where we're going to put a screw in to secure the drive to the motherboard. The first thing for us to do is to insert a standoff into one of these sockets at the back of the motherboard to secure our drive in place. So I'm just going to line the drive up and I can see it's this furthest out socket that we're going to need to put the standoff into. You'll find the standoff in your motherboard box with the M.2 SSD screws so it's just a matter of screwing it in to the motherboard. Next we can go ahead and install our M.2 SSD by inserting it at a slight angle into the socket. We'll get a screw in the motherboard box which we can use to secure the drive to the standoff. The next thing for us to do is install our RAM into these sockets here. Now if we look we've got four potential sockets to put our RAM in. Our kit of RAM only has two sticks. So it's really important we don't just pick and choose which of them to install into. If we look at our motherboard manual, it tells us to install the RAM into the second and fourth socket along from the CPU if you've only got two sticks of RAM. There's also a little diagram on the motherboard which tells you the same thing. So the first thing for us to do is to open the clips to the sockets we're going to use. So importantly, this motherboard only has clips on the top. Other motherboards will have clips on the bottom, so just check your Pacific motherboard. This is our RAM. If you look closely at the gold connectors down the bottom of it, you'll notice they're not of equal length. So it's really important when we're lining things up in the socket that we line it up the right way round to avoid any damage. Okay, so I'm going to line the RAM up with the socket. Once we're happy everything's lined up, all I need to do is apply a little bit of pressure to the top of the RAM and it will push into the socket and the clip will close. Same process with our second stick of RAM. Line things up with the socket on both sides. 
once we're happy, things are lined up, apply a little bit of pressure to the top of the RAM, and it will lock into place. We're now ready to go ahead and get our motherboard into the case. If we look at the back, we can see we've got standoffs in three rows of three. Now these standoffs are currently in the right position for an ATX motherboard like we have. You'll notice there's extra holes in the back of the case and I've shown you in the accessory bag there's a little adapter that will let you move the standoffs and we've also got two additional standoffs we can add in. So I've checked already, these are in the right place for our motherboard. The other thing to point out is the standoff in the middle has a slightly different shape to it and it's designed to fit through the hole in the middle of the motherboard and help hold the motherboard in place. So when we insert our motherboard, we'll try and get this to go through the middle of our motherboard. And once we've done that, hopefully the motherboard will hold in place easier and allow us to get our screws into it. Now, importantly, this middle standoff is hollow, so we will put a screw through it as well. In some other cases, there's actually no hole in the middle standoff, and this is something people struggle with. They try to put a screw into it and can't understand why one won't go in. And the reason for that is there's actually no hole. Two other things to point out, our motherboard actually has the IO shield applied to it. If you've got a separate IO shield in the motherboard box, you need to go ahead and insert it before you put your motherboard in. And the final thing to mention is I show installation of the motherboard with the case standing upright, and that's to give you guys a better view. What you will find easier, if you put the case on its back, you'll find installing the motherboard a little bit easier. But if I was to do that, you wouldn't get a great view of it. Okay, so I'm going to insert the motherboard into the case, trying to line it up with the cutout at the back. And once we've got it there, I'm just going to try and get that middle standoff through the hole in the centre of the motherboard. Now we've got it there, I can go ahead and get a screw through that middle standoff. And now it's just a matter of getting the other eight screws in. The next thing I like to do is to go ahead and get our case cables plugged in. And the reason I like to do that is these are going to go into various places on the motherboard. And it's much easier to plug them in before we add anything else into the case where it's going to block some of the headers on the motherboard. So the case cables come from the front I.O. We've got USB Type-A ports on the front, and we're going to need to plug in this USB 3.0 header to our motherboard to allow those to work. We've got headphone and microphone jack, and to get them to work, we're going to need to plug in our HD audio cable. As well, we've got these tricky front panel connectors, and the reason I say they're tricky is we've got a whole variety of different pins that need to go onto the one header. So this is going to allow our power button to work, our reset switch to work, and also our power LED to work. So that would be what we would traditionally call case cables. Because this case has a built-in fan hub and also a RGB hub, it has some additional cables coming from it. So over to the left-hand side of this hub, we have got six connections for fans to allow the fans to be powered. You'll notice three of them are occupied at the moment, and that's because we've got two fans in the front and also one rear fan. So the fans are actually already plugged into the hub for power. So we've got our fans plugged into the hub, but generally the fan hub needs power. And we've got a SATA connector on the bottom, which is going to power our fan hub. Quite often coming from a fan hub, you'll have an extra wire that you plug into your motherboard. And that then allows your motherboard's fan curves to control the speed of the fans. They'll run faster when certain components in your case are hotter and run slower when they're not. And that running slower is going to result in less noise when the PC's at idle. This particular fan hub doesn't have one of those wires. So any fans that are plugged into this fan hub are going to run at the same speed all of the time, regardless of what's going on with the PC. In the other side of the fan hub, we've got three ARGB connectors. Our two case fans are taking up one of them each. The third connector has a double connector coming off it. One end of it goes down to light the Lian Lee logo on the front of the case. And then the other end coming from it goes into a standard three pin ARGB connector. So allowing us to extend the ARGB light and plug in an additional accessory to it. So for us, we're going to be able to plug our case fan into this or the pump from our AIO. The final connector coming from the fan hub is an ARGB connector. So it's a five volt addressable three pin cable, which we're gonna to need to plug into the corresponding header on our motherboard. If we do this, our motherboard software is then gonna be able to control all the lighting that is plugged in to this fan hub. And as well, any additional components that we plug in to the extra ARGB connector coming from the fan hub. 
So let's go ahead and make a start of getting some of the cables plugged into our motherboard. Okay, first thing for us to do is to plug our HD audio cable, which is going to go into this header on the far left hand side of the motherboard. So it's important we bring it through the cutout closest to the header. So I'm going to bring it through. If we look closely at the cable itself, we'll notice there's a pin missing on the top. The top row of the header also has a pin missing, so we need to line it up the right way round. Okay, so lining things up with the header and just push things into place. And then we'll go ahead and pull the excess cable out the back. Next, we've got our 3-pin 5-volt addressable ARGB header. You'll notice to this, the right of it, we've got a 12-volt 4-pin non-addressable RGB header. Now, importantly, these are not interchangeable. If you plug the wrong cable into the wrong header, there's a risk of you damage in your hardware. So we go ahead and bring the cable coming from our fan hub. What you'll notice is there's one pin, a gap, and then two pins, and it's the same pattern on our header. So it's important we line things up the right way and push things into place. And then again, pull the excess cable out the back. Next, we've got our tricky front panel connectors and they're gonna go into this header here. This all looks like one header, but it's actually this bit here that we're gonna to want to plug in over to the left-hand side. So when plugging these cables into the header, I would recommend you start in the bottom row, working your way from left to right and then doing the top row. The reason for that is if you plug the top row in first, you're gonna to struggle to see the pins on the bottom row. In the close-ups I show you in the video, it looks like I've done that the opposite way around. The only reason I've done that is to give you a really close-up view of each of the pins that been plugged in. So starting in the bottom row, working from left to right, the first two pins are for the hard drive LED. Our case doesn't have this. Next to that, we've got the reset switch into pins three and four in the bottom row. It doesn't matter which way the reset switch goes in, I'm just gonna plug it in with the text facing down. Moving back up to the top row, working from left to right, the first pin is for power LED positive, then we've got power LED negative. So again, I'm just gonna plug these in with the text facing down. Next to that, in the top row, pins three and four from the left, we've got the power switch. Again, it doesn't matter which way round it goes, but I'm gonna plug it in with the text facing down. Then I'm just gonna go ahead and pull the excess cable out the back. Next thing for us to plug in is our USB 3.0 cable. If we look at the cable, there's a little notch on it. There's also a notch on the header, so that's to help us line things up the right way. Real word of caution when plugging this in, the pins on this header are really fragile, so there's a real risk that you can bend them if you don't plug the cable in correctly. I have done this in the past, and if you do bend them, your front I.O. ports aren't gonna work. So take your time when plugging this in. If it's not going smoothly, stop. Bring the cable back and readjust rather than applying any unnecessary force. So I'm just gonna bring this cable through, making sure I've got the notches lined up, and then apply a little bit of pressure and it clips into place, and then we'll bring the excess cable out the back. This is our power supply. It's what we call a non-modular power supply, in that all the cables are actually plugged in. There's no additional slots to plug any optional cables in. The advantage of this is price. The disadvantage, obviously, is we're gonna have cables at the bottom of our case that we don't need. The advantage of a fully modular power supply is that you only need to plug the cables in that you're gonna use, so cable management is that little bit easier. But obviously to stick to the price of our build, I went for this particular power supply. Okay, so looking at the cables that we're gonna use, we have got an eight pin EPS cable, which is gonna provide additional power to our CPU. This is gonna go into the top left-hand side of the motherboard, so we're gonna use this. We've got a 24 pin connector, which is gonna supply power to the motherboard. Now this was the cable I had mentioned we can use an optional cable extension. We can plug this straight into our motherboard if we wish, Alternatively, I have picked up a black and white cable extension. So we want to use the cable extension. All we would need to do is line the notch up on this cable with the notch on this cable, and then push it all the way in until the clip closes. Now the advantage of this cable extension is that we can go ahead and plug this end into the motherboard. So the cable that will be shown at the front of the case has this slightly nicer appearance to it. Although actually this isn't a bad appearance as far as cables go. We're also gonna need a PCIe cable to power our graphics card. So we look at this cable, it has a six plus two pin connector here, 
and a six plus two pin connector here. So you can actually power a graphics card with two eight pin connectors. Our graphics card has a special adapter in the box that we're gonna to have to use. It converts an eight pin to a 12 pin connector. So we're gonna to need to go ahead and plug it in. So I'm gonna pick the connector on the end, line the six and the two pin connectors up, and then I've got this little adapter from the graphics card box, line the notches up and push it into place. The fan hub on the back of our case is gonna require a SATA connector for power, so we're gonna to need to use this cable. So this leaves us with two cables that we're not gonna use. All I'm gonna do is wrap this up again with a cable tie that came on it originally. Okay, we're now ready to get our power supply into the case. This is our power supplies intake fan, so it's important that we install the power supply with this facing down the way. It's gonna get plenty of fresh air if we install it facing down the way from outside the case. If we install it facing up the way, it's gonna get slightly warmer from inside the case. In other cases, it would be even worse because you'd have a solid panel directly above the power supply where it's got no source of air at all and there's a real risk of the power supply overheating. But in general, you want to install this with this facing outside the case if possible. So I'm just gonna go ahead and insert this from the side and then slide it all the way to the back of the case. Next, we can go ahead and secure the power supply into place using the screws from our case accessory bag. Next, we can go ahead and bring the cable labeled CPU through the cutout in the top left-hand side of the case. If we look closely at the cable, you see there's a little notch on one side and the header also has a notch on it as well. So we go ahead and line things up and then push the cable into place. And then we'll pull the excess cable out the back. Next, we can go ahead and bring our 24-pin power cable through the cutout to the right-hand side of the motherboard. As I've mentioned, I'll show you both with and without the cable extensions. If we look closely at the cable, there's a clip on one side. There's also a notch on the right-hand side of the header. So we just need to bend things around, line things up with the header. And once we're happy, things are lined up, push the cable into place and then pull the excess cable out the back. So you can get an idea of what that looks like with the standard cables. If you're gonna go ahead and use the cable extension, we just need to bring it through the cutout. Again, line things up with the header. And then once we're happy, push things into place. Now this cable extension does come with two cable combs to help tidy the cables up. We can go ahead and bring the cable for our graphics card through this cutout here at the bottom of the case. So whenever we're ready to install our graphics card, we'll have the power supply ready. The last cable to plug into our power supply is the SATA cable coming from the fan hub. It is an L shape, so it's important we line it up the right way with the cable coming from the power supply. Next thing for us to do is to go ahead and change the rear case fan for the one we've got with ARGB on it. If you're not planning on doing this, just go ahead and skip this step. This fan is already plugged into the fan hub at the back, so there's nothing additional that needs done with it. So the fan's held on with four screws, which we need to go ahead and remove. So just as we're removing the last screw, I've put a hand on the fan so it doesn't fall down. Next, we can go ahead and trace the fan along to the fan hub and just simply pull the cable out. With the cable removed, we should simply be able to remove the fan from the case. Next, we can go ahead and feed the cables coming from our new fan out the back of the case. Next, we can go ahead and secure the fan into place using the same screws we've just removed. Take care not to over tighten the screws because this is a common cause of fan noise. If you over tighten them, you can distort the fan out of shape. Okay, coming from the fans, we've got two wires. We've got a standard four pin fan connector and we've also got a three pin five volt addressable ARGB header. One of the nice things about this particular fan is we can daisy chain another device into it. There's an additional header here, which is gonna be very convenient for the setup because our motherboard actually only has one single five volt, three pin addressable header. Okay, so let's talk about powering the fan first of all. We've got two different options, but I think only one of them is a good option. So we can go ahead and plug the fan into our fan hub. We've now got four ports left on it. And even though the headers on the fan hub have got three pins and our cable has got four pins, because there's little notches on the cable itself and little notches on the header, it's only gonna plug into the right three pins. 
the only slight problem with doing this is this fan hub is probably going to run the fans at full speed. It's not really a big problem for the fans at the front of the case because their maximum speed is 800 revs per minute. The fan that we have removed at the back had a maximum speed of 1100 revs per minute. So even in running at full speed, they're probably not going to be that noisy. The fan that we have just installed has a maximum speed of 1800 revs per minute. And I can pretty much guarantee that running at full speed all the time is going to be pretty noisy. So our alternative option is to plug this into one of the fan headers on our motherboard. The motherboard is then going to be able to adjust the speed of the fan depending on the temperature of the system. And I'll show you how to do that later when we enter the BIOS. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this into one of the headers on the motherboard because I think that's a better option. So down at the bottom of the motherboard we've got two fan headers. We've also got a third case fan header just over to the left hand side of the CPU beside the pump header. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug into this header here and then pull the excess cable out the back. Okay, the next thing for us to do is to plug the ARGB cable coming from our rear fan into the cable coming from our fan hub. So again, just line the pins up with the cable and push them into place. And again, one of the nice things about this fan is we're going to have an additional header here that we can use when we install our AIO. So this is our AIO. The first thing for us to do is to put the brackets onto the pump head. There's different brackets depending on the socket. These ones are for the M4 socket. So what we're going to want to do is line the bracket up with the front of the AIO and then we're going to use two of the screws to secure each of the bracket on. Next thing for us to do is to go ahead and get the fans on the I.O. But I want to talk a little bit about the orientation of the fans. So this is the front of the fans. The fan blades are unobstructed. This is the back. We've got these little bits of plastic obstructing the fan blades. So air is going to come in from the front of the fan and out the back. So it's important we put the fan on the radiator the right way round. We're going to have our radiator at the top as an exhaust. So air from the case is going to be blowing through the radiator and then out the top. So we're going to need to install the fan this way with the front of the fan facing into the case. The next thing we're going to want is the cable coming from the fan facing the rear of the case. Obviously if it was facing the front we would see the cables. So I've already lined the radiator up in the case and I think it's going to look best with the tubes over to the right hand side. So that means we're going to need to line our fans up in the radiator this way round because this is going to be the back of the case. Next we can go ahead and take the long screws that came with the I.O. and secure the fans to the radiator. So I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the wiring of both the fans and the pump while we've got the I.O. on the table because it's going to be a little bit easier to see things. So coming from both of the fans we have got a standard four pin fan connector. We're going to want both these fans to run at the same speed and the speed is going to be adjusted by the motherboard depending on the temperature of the CPU. If the CPU is hotter, the fans are going to spin faster. So our CPU is only one CPU fan header, but that's not a problem because in the kit we get a double fan splitter cable. So I'm going to go ahead and plug the connector from each fan into the double fan splitter cable. Okay, so now we've only got one four pin connector, which we're going to need to plug into our CPU fan header, and that's going to control the speed of the fans. So next we go ahead and look at our pump. There's two wires coming from the pump. The first is a three pin fan connector, and it is designed to power the pump, but also to control the pump speed. And we're going to plug this into our motherboard's pump header. Our pump header has four pins. It doesn't matter that this pin only has a three pin connector. The only thing we're going to need to do is to make sure we run it in DC mode rather than PWM mode. If we run it in PWM mode, the pump will run at full speed all the time because we're missing the fourth pin. The other connector we've got from the pump is one we should be familiar with by now. It's a 5 volt, 3 pin addressable ARGB connector. We have one spare connector at the back of the case and it is coming off the fan that we have installed. So it's not a big problem for us. We can just plug this directly into there and all our ARGB is going to sync 
both with the case and the motherboard. So if you've gone with a different case fan at the back, which doesn't have the ARGB connector, and you've ran out of ARGB ports on your motherboard like we have, this isn't going to work for you. So you're going to have to look at another option. So Killer Master with this kit do also provide a controller. So all you would need to do is plug this wire into the controller, line things up and push it in. Cutter Master also provide a nice little adapter that fits over the top of the cables, preventing them from coming loose. We would just need to plug the other end of the controller into our SATA power supply, and then we can press this little button to cycle through the different ARGB effects. The only side downside to this is you're going to have a slightly different ARGB effects on your pump than you will in the rest of the case. An alternative option would be to use the header on your motherboard to plug this cable to directly. It would then mean that you're not going to be able to plug the case cable directly into the motherboard. So you would have a bit of a choice there between what syncs up with the motherboard. Your third option would be to get something like this, and this is a Cooler Master Triple ARGB splitter cable. Remember, it's ARGB, not RGB. If you get RGB, you'll get the 12 volt version. You can then plug this end into the single ARGB connector on our motherboard. We can plug one end into the pump on our AIO. We can plug another end into our controller at the back of the case. And then you could plug the third end into your ARGB fan at the back of the case if you've gone for one with a different version. It just so happens the fan that we've got having that extra spitter cable is going to save us a whole load of hassle. And I'll just give you a quick look at what the box for that cable looks like. We're now ready to go ahead and get our AIO into the case. The only problem is once we put it in, it's going to go quite hard to plug the CPU fan header into the top of the motherboard. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this cable in first of all. Okay, so this is the CPU fan header at the top of the motherboard. I'm just going to go ahead and line the double fan splitter cable coming from our fans in the radiator up with the header. And then once we're happy, things are lined up, push things into place. Then what I'm going to do, as I'm bringing the radiator up, I'm going to pull excess cable coming from these fans out the back of the case. And then I'm going to bring the radiator up to the top. Okay, next thing to do is to get some screws into the radiator at the top. Okay, we can now go ahead and replace the top dust filter. Next, we're going to need to apply some thermal paste to the CPU. This is going to come with the I.O. So I normally apply a pea-sized amount to the center of the CPU. Okay, so that looks good. Now, importantly, I have used this I.O. before. If you're using it for the first time, there'll be some plastic protection over the cold plate, which you'll need to remove before using it. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and lower this down. And what we're going to want to do is get these clips here over the back of these clips here. So I'm going to start up at the top and try and get the back clip on. So that's the back clip on. And then I'm going to lower the front clip down and get it on as well. So they're both now in place. So I'm going to start tightening up the thumb screws on each side. Okay, so we're ready to plug the three pin connector into the pump AIO header. Now it's over here. I'll show you what it looks like with it plugged in. Now the only problem with this is we're going to have this cable stretching all the way over the motherboard and it doesn't look very good. Even if we were to tidy it up, you're still going to see this cable. So there is an additional CPU header up here just below the CPU fan header. So I'm going to go ahead and plug the cable into here and then I'm going to be able to pull both cables out the back and we're going to see much less of them. So I'm just going to line this up with the header on the top here. And then what I'm going to do is pull the excess cable out the back. I think that definitely looks tighter than having both the cables stretching over the motherboard to here. Last thing for us to connect up is the ARGB cable coming from the pump to the additional header coming from our case fan. So we'll go ahead and line things up and push into place. So we're now ready to go ahead and install our graphics card. If we look at the motherboard, there's actually three slots which are long enough to take our graphics card. But in general, it's the top slot you want to install in. It's going to have the most PCIe lanes associated to it, and then it's going to run at the fastest speed. So to use the top slot, we're going to have to remove the second and third screw here. 
with the thumb screws removed, we should simply just be able to pull the slot covers away. To prepare the motherboard to receive the graphics card, we just need to open the slot clip here. Next, we just need to go ahead and line the graphics card up with the slot. Once we're happy things are lined up, it's just a little bit of firm pressure and the graphics card slots into place and the clip closes. We can then go ahead and secure the graphics card into place with the thumb screws we removed earlier on. The last thing to do is to go ahead and plug the power cable into the graphics card. There we go, and we'll just make sure all the excess cable is out the back. The final job for us is some cable management. We need to tidy this mess of cables up so we're able to get the back panel back on. Off note, we do have some Velcro cable ties here and we've got other cable tie points we can use the cable ties that came in the accessory bag. There's also plenty of space at the bottom of the case for excess power supply cables. Okay, we can go ahead and put the panels back on. Okay, so that's the build complete. I think it looks great, but does it run? So we need to flip the power switch and see what happens. Importantly, I have loaded a Windows 10 bootable USB drive into the back of the PC. If you don't know how to make one of those, I've made a video on it, and you'll find a link to that in the description. Okay, here it goes. Okay, so that's a good sign. We've got fan spinning, lights on the motherboard, lights on the fans. Next thing we're looking for is the ASUS logo to appear on the monitor. So we'll keep an eye on the monitor. And there we go, we've got the Republic of Gamers logo appearing. Next thing what we're looking for is the Windows logo to appear. And if that appears, it'll have found the bootable USB drive in the back of the computer and boot it off that. Because importantly, the SST we have installed in the motherboard doesn't have any operating system on it at the moment. So we just need to watch the screen patiently and see what happens. So there's the Windows logo appearing, which is a good sign. And then the next thing we're looking for is the Windows installer screen to appear, which has just appeared. So I'm gonna show you how to install Windows 10, but to make things a little bit easier, I'm gonna swap over to the screen mode. Okay, I'm now gonna show you how to install Windows 10. I'm gonna select the options that are relevant to me. Obviously, if you have different options, go ahead and select the ones that are relevant to you. So I'm from the United Kingdom. I'm just gonna go ahead and click Next. I'm gonna click Install Now. Okay, if you've got a Windows 10 product key, go ahead and enter it in the box. If you don't have one, you can click this button here and then enter the version of Windows you're gonna get a product key for. I do have one, so I'm gonna go ahead and enter my product key into the box here. Then we need to accept the license terms and click Next. We're gonna go for a custom install. We've only got one drive installed, so that's what's showing up. We'll select it and click Next. And this step is gonna take a little bit of time, so I'll go ahead and speed that up for you. Okay, so I'm from the United Kingdom. I'm gonna select United Kingdom and click yes, and yes again. I'm gonna skip the secondary keyboard layout. So I'm gonna set this up for personal use, click next. If you've got a Microsoft account, go ahead and enter your details now. If you don't, you can create an online account, or if you don't have an internet connection, you can go ahead and create an offline account. I'm gonna go ahead and put my details in now. And go ahead and create a pin. And then again, over the next few pages, I'm gonna select various options. You don't have to copy me, pick whatever options you want. So I'm not going to use online speech recognition. I'm going to click yes. Yes again. I'm just going to send the required diagnostic data. Uh, no thinking. No again. No again. I'm going to skip all this for now. I'm going to say do this later. Um, I'm going to say only see if finds to this PC. No thanks. Not now. Okay, so that's Windows 10 installed. A pop-up has appeared asking us if we want to download the Armory Create app. Now we are gonna to need to use the RGB software in this to control the lighting. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and click yes. Okay, we just need to click I agree and accept. And I'll come back and show you how this works later on.
Okay, normally when Windows installs, I don't install any programs or drivers until we've got Windows fully up to date. The reason I did that was there was a pop-up and it will save us finding it later on. So next we want to get Windows fully up to date. So we're going to go ahead and click on the Windows icon, click on the settings. We're going to scan down and go to updates and security. We're going to go to check for updates. And what Windows is going to find some updates, um, it's going to go ahead and update them. It's probably then going to need to restart. There'll probably be more updates, but we're not going to move on until we get Windows fully up to date. Okay, so that's Windows 10 fully up to date. Whenever I click on check for updates, there's no further updates available. Next thing I want to show you, if we go over to this PC, we can see we have got our SSD showing up. If you've actually installed more than one SSD or hard drive in the build, the chances are only one of them is actually going to be showing up at the moment. If you want to get them all to show up, I've made a video on the steps you need to take. I can't obviously show you now because we've only got the one drive installed in our build. So you'll need to go ahead and look at that video and follow the steps to get the rest of your drives to show up. Okay, next thing for us to do is to go ahead and install some drivers. We're going to get these from a variety of different places, but don't worry about trying to note the links down as you go along. You'll find them all in the description. So we're over on our motherboards page over on Azusa's website, and we'll have a look at the drivers and tools that are available. First thing we're going to do is have a look and see what BIOS versions are available. The first thing I want to do is to go ahead and download the latest BIOS. Now the latest BIOS is in beta version. You may well want to go ahead and download the last stable version of the BIOS. I'm going to go ahead and download the beta version. So we'll head over to the Downloads folder. I'm going to right click and go Extract All and Extract. Now what I'm going to go ahead and do is copy this extracted folder. Go to Copy and I'm going to go to this PC and I've plugged an external USB drive which importantly is formatted in FAT32 and I'm going to go ahead and paste the BIOS file here. So later on when we visit the BIOS, I can show you how to update it. Okay, next thing for us to do is to see which drivers are available. Okay, so we've got the LAN driver. We'll go ahead and download that. Chipset driver, I'm going to get directly from AMD's website. Audio drivers, we'll go ahead and download those. VGA drivers, we're not going to need. Um, our CPU doesn't have integrated graphics. We have an NVIDIA graphics card, so we're going to get our drivers from NVIDIA. Software and utilities, you'll find a whole range of downloads here. We can expand to see the different versions. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and install any of those. There's SATA drivers. Um, we're not going to need these. You need these really if you're going to set up RAID. And there's the Armory crate. Um, remember, we got the pop-up earlier on. Now, if you do want to install it from here, you didn't install it earlier, the first file is actually the uninstall tool. So you're going to have to click on See All Downloads to actually get the package itself. Okay, so that's the two driver files that have downloaded to our Downloads folder. I'm just going to right click on them and click Extract All and click Extract. And then I'm going to do the same with the LAN driver. Right click Extract All, Extract. Okay, the two compressed folders we can go ahead and delete. Okay, we'll make a start with the audio driver. So I'm going to open the folder, scan down, there's the setup. Click on it, click yes. Okay, so that's the audio drivers installed. We'll go ahead and install the LAN drivers. We'll open the folder, we'll go click on the setup, click yes. Okay, we can go ahead and click on the setup, click yes. So I've tried installing the LAN drivers a few times, and normally when you click on it, a pop-up window will appear, the same as what happened with our audio drivers, and then we'll be able to install the drivers. For some reason this isn't happening, I'm not sure why. Um, maybe when they release a later version of the drivers, it'll work okay. I'm not so bothered because quite often I don't install the LAN drivers for the motherboard. Windows will find alternative drivers 
and things seem to be working perfectly fine at the moment. So we'll move on to the chipset drivers. Okay, so we're over on AMD's website. We're gonna go ahead and get our chipset driver. So we'll click on chipset. We've got an AM4 socket and a B450 motherboard, and we'll click submit. If we scan down and expand here, we've got the driver. So I'm gonna go ahead and click download. So we go ahead and open the file. Click yes, and we're gonna click on install. Okay, to finish the install, we're gonna to have to click restart. I would normally restart each time this appears rather than try and install anything else and restarting all together. So we'll click restart now. Okay, last lot of drivers for us to install are the drivers for our graphics card. We're gonna to need to get these from NVIDIA's website. We can either just install the drivers by themselves or install the GeForce Experience. I prefer just to install the GeForce Experience, so that's what I'll show you how to do. Go ahead and click download now. Okay, we can go ahead and click open file. Click yes. Click Agree and Install. Okay, we then need to log in. If you don't have a login, you can go ahead and create an account. I'll put my details in now. So it's found a Game Ready driver first and started downloading it. If we click on these dots, we can choose the version of the drivers that we want to install. We can either go for Game Ready drivers or Studio drivers. So I'm just gonna let this finish downloading. Okay, we can go ahead and click Express Installation. Click Yes. So it's gonna go ahead and install the drivers. Don't worry if your screen flickers during this, that's very normal as the drivers are being installed. Okay, the next thing I want to do is give you a look at how you control the RGB in the case. So to do that, we're gonna to have to open the Armory Crate. So we'll go ahead and open that up. So at the moment, it has given us the option to sync everything. So that's the lighting on the motherboard and you can see the lighting on the top left-hand side of the motherboard, the memory itself, and also the addressable strip. So the addressable strip is everything else because we have plugged all the case lighting into that ARGB header on the motherboard. So we can go ahead and click on the Aura effects. And what we can see at the moment, we're set to rainbow with a medium speed. We have a whole variety of different effects on the motherboard. We can just go ahead and speed the speed up if we want or slow it right the way down. And what you'll notice is everything is syncing. So the motherboard lighting, the RAM, the pump header, and all our fans. And I think the effects look absolutely great. We have a whole variety of different effects here on the screen. We can go for a static color where it's set to yellow, go into yellow and change a different color and pick whatever we want the lighting to be set to. We could go for color cycle, where it'll cycle through the different color. And you'll notice absolutely everything in the case is synced up at the moment, which is one of the advantages of the way I have set things up. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna put things back to a steady color because it's gonna make it much easier to see how the case lighting works. So we'll go to static and we'll go for a yellow because I don't think that's one of the features of the case lights and go to okay. So at the moment, everything in the case is being controlled by the motherboard. We've got a button on the top of the case which is gonna let us cycle through the case effects. So if you notice when I press this, what has happened is everything that's connected up to the case lighting has changed color to a static blue. So the front fans, the rear fans, the pump lighting, but what you'll notice, the lighting on the RAM and the lighting on the motherboard are still being controlled by the motherboard software. I can cycle through the different effects on the case. There's a yellow color. It looks very similar, but it's not the same yellow. And if I keep cycling through, we've got a whole range of steady colors. But again, the lighting on the back and the lighting on the RAM isn't changed because there's no way for our case to control that lighting. So you can see these are all the different effects we have from the case lighting. And I think there's some really nice effects there. And that's just back onto the steady colors again. So you'll notice we have cycled all the way through, but we haven't got back to the motherboard control. How we enable motherboard control is we want to hold this button in. 
So you'll notice when I hold them up and in, we're now back to the motherboard controlling all the lighting in the case. So if I go back to the computer screen again, and I'll select rainbow, that is now everything in the case set to rainbow. It's set it to a very slow speed. I'm going to return it to the medium speed. There we go. I think that looks great. That's all the RGB synced up looking really well. So I think the way I've set it up is probably the way you're going to want to set it up. And you probably are going to want to use the motherboard to control the lighting because that's the only way you're going to be able to get your RAM synced up and also your lighting on the motherboard. To enter the BIOS, what we're going to do, we're going to click on the Windows icon, click on the power option, and click on Restart. What we're going to do is we're going to need to press the Delete key whenever the ASUS logo first appears. That can be quite hard to time, so what I normally do is wait until the screen goes blank, and then press the Delete key. So that's the end of the BIOS. To go ahead and update the BIOS, we're going to click on the Tool. We're going to click on the Flash Utility. We're going to go ahead and select our BIOS, which is this file here, and we're going to click Yes. It's going to ask us, do we really want to update the BIOS? Importantly, we should really only update if the BIOS offers new features that we need or we're having problems with our computer. Because if things go wrong during the BIOS update, it can break the motherboard, and it's really important the computer doesn't lose power during the BIOS update. So I'm going to go ahead and click Yes. And then we'll see the process along the bottom. Okay, that's the BIOS update to the latest version. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Okay, we need to press F1 to run the setup. Okay, so that's us back into the BIOS, and we can see the BIOS version has been updated to the latest version. I'm just going to go ahead and press F7 to make things a little bit easier to see. Okay, so we have a look at our RAM. We can see it's currently running at 2400 megahertz. We know it can run at 3600 megahertz, so we need to enable DOCP. So we click on here, it's currently disabled, and we've got two different profiles. So let's have a look and see what we've got. Profile 1 is 3603 megahertz, whereas profile 2 is 3000 megahertz. So I'm going to go ahead and enable profile number 1. Next, we're going to want to have a look at the fans and check how they've been set up. So let's go ahead and click on Q Fan Control. So the CPU fan header, we've got the two fans on the radiator plugged in with a double fan splitter cable. So we can see it's currently running in the standard profile in DC mode. Now importantly, both the fans on the radiator have four pin connectors, so they can run in PWM mode. So I'm going to go ahead and enable PWM mode. And that's going to significantly bring the speed of the fans down, and I can hear the noise significantly decreasing in the background. We do have a few other options. There's a, we're currently on the si standard profile. I can enable the silent profile, the turbo profile. We can run the fans at full speed, and you'll hear the noise increase in the background. Or we can create our own profile by clicking on manual. You can see we've got temperature down the bottom, percentage up the side, and we can drag these points on the curve to where we want them to be. And by doing that, we can then adjust our own fan curve. So at different temperatures, the fans are going to run at a certain rate. I'm just going to leave things on the standard curve for now. So the other header that's showing up is the AIO pump. And by standard, that runs at 100% speed. Now, we didn't plug our pump header into the IO pump header because it was going to be running across the motherboard. So it looks like there's no way to control the CPU opt header, which we have plugged our pump into. But if you actually look in the motherboard manual, it shares the same settings as what you've set up for the CPU fan header. So our pump is going to be running in this curve in PWM mode, which we have enabled. Now, because our pump only has three pins on it, and we're running it in PWM mode, it's actually going to run at 100% all of the time. So, inadvertently, it's actually going to match what the AIO header is set to at the moment, and I'm completely happy with that. I normally run the pump at 100%. Our motherboard has three chassis fan headers. The only one that we've actually plugged anything into was chassis fan header number two. We can see at the moment it's running in PWM mode and in the standard fan curve. So that's things set up just the way I want them to be. So I'm going to go ahead and click Escape to save our settings. 
Okay, so that's the BIOS updated. We've enabled DOCP and we've got our fans running just the way we want them to. If you have a look down the bottom of the motherboard here, we can see that the CPU fan is running at this speed, the chassis fan at this speed, and the CPU opt is now running at full speed, which is what we wanted the pump to do. Okay, to save our settings, we can either click here or press F10. So it's gonna give a summary of everything that we have changed on the screen, and we can click OK to accept. And then the PC should boot back up into Windows. Okay, the first thing for us to check is that our RAM is in fact running at the correct speed. So we right click on the Windows logo and click on Task Manager. We then wanna go for more details, performance and memory. And we can see now our RAM is running at 3600 megahertz speed. Okay, so that's us finished. Everything's up and running just the way it should. And importantly, the PC looks absolutely brilliant. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you a little bit of footage of the completed build and then I'm gonna run some benchmarks to give you an idea of the performance you can expect from the PC should you want to copy the build guide. Thank you.